Imagine a volcano. What do you picture? A plume of smoky, fiery ash? A bright red river of lava covering everything below it? Maybe the ground is shaking. It's the stuff of movies. But in fact, for many, many people who live near one, volcanoes are a constant part of reality. Something that has been there forever. Take, for example, the island of Java in Indonesia with 45 active volcanoes and 141 million residents, most of whom are close enough to be directly impacted by eruptions. Over the last 30 years, the number of people who live within 100 kilometers or 60 miles from an active volcano has grown from 500 million to 800 million. At this rate, in less than 20 years, it will be a full billion. 25 million people are within 5 kilometers or 3 miles range. So why would you ever live near an active volcano? Would you? In fact, there's lots of good reasons to. Volcanoes produce a very fertile soil, which is great for farming. Their higher elevation allows for cooler temperatures, which is becoming more and more desired in the face of global warming. Some volcanoes are also the source of geothermal energy or host deposits of metals and minerals, making them the target of mining. Volcanoes hold spiritual and religious significance to the nearby communities. They can become a mark of heritage or identity. But also, volcanoes are beautiful and people want to come see them. So volcano tourism is very attractive. Another reason of why people live so close to volcanoes is that sometimes they don't have a choice. Vulnerable groups have naturally expanded into or have been pushed into the hazard zone. Still, with all these benefits, we all understand that living close to an active volcano is dangerous. Even without a full-on eruption, many volcanoes release gases that can be toxic to humans, animals, and plants. When they do erupt, ash from volcanoes can travel hundreds of miles away, make buildings collapse, and humans get sick or die. And lava flows can hurt infrastructure. If volcanic ash gets mixed with water from rain or melting glaciers, it can form fast-moving flows of hot mud called lahars that bury everything in their path. In addition to the people who live close to volcanoes, thousands of airplanes fly over active volcanoes every day, moving people and cargo between continents and countries. Volcanic ash can center onto airplane engines, make them stall, and the airplane to crash or at least be seriously damaged. Lots of people, even those who can see a volcano from their kitchen window, hold misconceptions about them. For example, that there is no risk to them personally because their volcano hadn't done anything in a very long time. Or that if the volcano does become active, that there will be enough signs and we could just run away or outrun the lava or the ash, which you cannot. Some even believe that you can prevent or stop an eruption if you release the pressure by throwing a bomb into a volcano or even let Tom Hanks jump into it, like in the 1990s Joe vs. the Volcano movie. Spoiler alert, neither is going to work. Most dangerous is the assumption that all volcanoes behave the same. They don't. Not even the same volcano repeats itself exactly the same way every time it erupts. It is true, though, the volcanoes are not our fault. Unlike things like climate change or air pollution, nothing we did caused them, and there is nothing we can do to control volcanoes or stop them from erupting. However, they're still our responsibility. People often ask me how I got into studying volcanoes. I didn't grow on one or even close to one. I don't live near one or even close to one now. But ever since I was little, I loved rocks. I'd stare at layers of sediments and want to understand why they looked the way they did. What forces made them bend, break, or tilt? So I studied geophysics, which is the physics part of geology. It started as just me being curious about rocks. But then I realized that what I do can actually help people. And that with volcanoes, the potential is right there for me to grab and run with. That's exactly what I'm devoting my career to doing. But in order to do that, I need help addressing a few problems. First, 
we're only watching a few volcanoes, instead of all of them, in enough detail. You see, most volcanoes do give out signs before eruption. In a way, they're more like hurricanes than like earthquakes. So we could theoretically forecast eruptions. But to do a good job in forecasting, we need data. Lots of it, from different places, at different times, and of different kinds. And right now, a lot of our understanding of how volcanoes work is based on few selected cases, which everybody goes to study. So we have a data bias. Second, we come in after the fact, instead of before. Volcanoes play the long game. Many volcanoes really don't do much for most of the time. And many years can pass between eruptions. So to really study them, you might have to park a team of scientists at the base of a volcano for 20 years with maybe nothing happening. This kind of long-term study is not a funding priority. So we become like the EMTs of volcanic study, going in the aftermath of an eruption and study what happened. But that is really not as useful and much more expensive. It's kind of like the health department going to raid a restaurant after there was a massive food poisoning instead of doing the monthly checkups. Or studying a hurricane after it made landfall instead of tracking it every second along its path. Third, the data that is being collected isn't always shared or shared in time. Local government agencies, which are usually in charge of monitoring and collecting data at volcanoes, are usually seriously strapped for funds. And in many cases, they're either not allowed or have no incentive to share their data with the global science community and do it in time. So not all the brains that could help out are able to do that. But we know what to do. We actually can do this now, if we had the time, the money, and the collaborations. The sensors that we need to study, the, how volcanoes shake, change, um, release gases, these all exist. New global communications by satellite constellations now have enough bandwidth to send all that data from all these volcanoes to all the world scientists. Computers are now strong enough to process all that data and we can make much fancier forecasting models than we did before. We're also coming up with new technologies that make it safer and easier to collect data all the time. For example, drones that can sniff the gases so that people don't need to fly over a toxic plume in a helicopter. Or drones that can take videos of flowing lava to see how runny it is, how fast it's moving, without people needing to go anywhere near it. For example, in 2018, Kilauea volcano in Hawaii erupted. My team and I went there with our drones that have night vision video cameras. We collected tons of data of how the lava was moving, how it was changing over time. But all the tech in the world won't matter if there is an incentive and funds to get it out there on the volcanoes and then get the data back quickly and openly to the scientists so that they, we, can fulfill our mission to save lives and help humanity. I'm told I'm a pretty realistic, grounded person. Well, I am an Earth scientist. So when I dream up solutions to problems, I dream of what I see as achievable. Data is achievable, research is achievable, real time and open sharing is achievable. And while we cannot prevent volcanic eruptions, we can prevent or at least try to minimize the disruption that they cause. In fact, we must do this for the almost billion people who live with active volcanoes in their backyards.